So, this is uh, one of my favorite slides. This is an old postcard, back when people used to send postcards before they Instagrammed everything. Um, this is just off of Summerland, just uh, where the, it used to be a place called the Big Yellow House. Now most of the letters have fallen out. It just says like, ow, or something like that now. <laughs> Um, but this is uh, the first place in the world that anyone did offshore oil drilling. It wasn't very complex. It was essentially, essentially the same old tech that we'd been using on land, which was very primitive back in the day. And they just uh, put out some wooden uh, piers and just did it over the water in, in very shallow waters. So this is the first place we really um, did anything like this. And that was because this area was full, our area, our home, is full of oil reserves. So, for example, here is an area up by the Mesa, um, near, near downtown Santa Barbara. Right now this is covered with houses. Back in the day, in the 1930s, it was covered with oil derricks. If you guys have anybody seen the movie, There Will Be Blood? So that's, that's, basic, that's based on, uh, you know, it's fictionalized, but that's essentially based on Kern County, Eastern, or, well, yeah, Far Eastern Ventura County. So all those things, you know, this was the Wild West of oil and gas production, um, especially back in the day. Uh, a lot of our oil here in Santa, here in Santa Barbara, Ventura County, the, the Southern California Bight, is really thick oil. I, I apologize, I should have brought some samples of oil in to show you guys. But oil is a range of material, a range of hydrocarbons, not dead dinosaurs, what people will tell you. It's not, not from dinosaurs. There might be a few dinosaurs here and there. It's mostly dead plankton, mostly dead plants, dead phytoplankton that have accumulated. And uh, there's a whole range of material, right? There's natural gas, very, very light. There's stuff medium range. There's, there's thick stuff. The stuff that we tend to have here tends to be more of the really thick stuff, enriched in asphaltines, enriched in the thickest part, the most tar-like part of the oil spectrum. Um, and so, indeed, uh, where, where I did my undergraduate used to be an asphalt mine. So UCSB used to be a, a common place where people would go and excavate uh, chunks of, uh, chunks of um, oily rock that you could then melt down and essentially turn into a roadbed uh, or, or something similar right there. Um, and more of this activity uh, back in the day where it, the material was very easy to get to. One of the reasons why this was one of the first places, uh, first best places in our country for oil and gas extraction was because it was so easy to see and so easy to get. I just spoke with my other, with my coastal marine management class about this the other day, but, but uh, suffice it to say, one of the key things that we have here in terms of our uh, First Nation peoples were tumuls. So plank canoes, the only, one of the only places in the world anybody used this technology. Everywhere else it was dug out, it was, it was walrus skin stretched over wood or, or bone or something to make a boat. Here we just took planks, stuck them together that otherwise would totally leak and wouldn't keep the, the riders above water. But we had so much tar and, and, and asphalt and stuff just floating around uh, on the beach, inland, that the Chumash picked that stuff up and just filled in the cracks in the planks and they made their famous tumbles. And again, that was because this resource was so right there, so easy to get. You didn't need much. In this case, these guys just knocked off a couple plants, scraped off the plants and just started digging and mining the particular resource in question. I think we, we often, in our part of the world, we think of the oil platforms, right? The offshore oil platforms is the iconic thing in the Santa Barbara Channel off the coast of Ventura County coast of Santa Barbara County. Um, they, do, they, they actually extend down into uh, off of Los Angeles County, but this is the classic place because they're so close in. You drive along the 101, you look to the side, and you see these, this, this string of platforms. So we tend to think of our area as producing oil and gas primarily, I think, from the water. Um, and we think about these things. So currently we have 23 active platforms in federal waters, which is right, uh, farther than three nautical miles, and then state waters, uh, in state waters we have four platforms. If any of this stuff does, doesn't make sense or what have you, let me know. I, I don't, I'm not sure what Dr. Steele uh, talked to you guys about yet in terms of jurisdictions and things, but, but pipe up if I don't make sense. Okay, so this is what we think about. Also, just as a side note, there never will ever be anything like these ever again in the history of our species. 
We've gone to much different technology being applied. And essentially, these are skyscrapers in the ocean, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet of, of uh, steel girders, and, and literally just like we were building a bridge, no longer. Now we have um, essentially dynamically positioned platforms. So one, we've gone deeper, and so, so we're pretty much at the limits of what we could do structurally with these things. And so going deeper is even that more of a challenge, insanely expensive. So now we essentially f make the platforms f really, really buoyant, so they float really high, and then we anchor them down to the bottom with steel cables, steel harpoons. So it's anchored to the bottom, but in a temporary fashion. Whenever that, it, for example, in the North Sea and other places around the world, where we're extracting oil in deep areas, when we're done, we just essentially cut those cables and the thing floats up. There's no massive superstructure as there is uh, here off our coast. So we think about this kind of stuff, but this is perhaps a better portrayal. These are well, these are active wellheads in Ventura County. So yes, we have the offshore stuff totally, but we have a huge amount of production going on in the main, on the terrestrial side of things as well. And we just sometimes don't notice those. So these are uh, various um, uh, types of wellheads. Some are oil, some are gas. But from the perspective of managing these things, oil and gas wellheads, kind of the same thing, right? It's basically a big straw punched into the ground and punched into a reservoir, a, a pocket of hydrocarbon, and then we suck that hydrocarbon out. Sometimes we can just, uh, there's so much pressure, you just put that straw in and the stuff squirts on out. Sometimes we have to add additional materials to pressurize that to make things come on out. But either way, it's about removing material from um, a subsurface cavern. In many cases, there's both gas and oil together. Gas and oil and other stuff. So the gas floats on top, the oil is a little bit um, uh, below that, and then depending on where we are, there might be water mixed in with there, there might be other uh, metals and things like that uh, intermixed with that stuff. If you guys, and so for example, here's a shot of the Santa Clara Valley. So this would be, for example, if you're in Ventura driving towards Ojai, this is basically where you'd be driving through if it was 1928. And again, that whole area is a massive oil field uh, back then. Uh, now much of our production has migrated just slightly out of sight. And we tend to not see it unless you've fallen asleep and are in the back seat and you're in the 101, you're going up to Santa Barbara and you, and you go, wake up at night and you look and you're, what's there's a flame off the side of the right, right side of the road, right? No, it's not a flame. Well, it is a flame, but I mean, it's not a, not a fire. It's just some, in that case, that's venting a gas from some oil uh, refineries. That whole ridge, when you're driving between Ventura and Santa Barbara, that whole ridge to the right, that whole mesa up there is, is in a lot of production still for oil and gas. And so if we look at a map of Ventura County, what we see is, uh, in this case, the orange are major oil field formations. The red is the city of Ventura. Um, and then uh, uh, the blue here is representing some of our significant groundwater basins. So oil and gas is, is mixed up oftentimes with water. And a lot of times we worry about water contamination, water pollution, all that kind of good stuff. Cool? Questions so far? All right. If you guys want to find out more, and I encourage you guys to do this, not now because I'm so interesting and engaging as a lecturer, but, but after I'm done, if you guys want to go to uh, the division uh, within the state of California that handles oil and gas uh, wellheads and leases, um, on land at least, um, you can go to Dogger and look up their map uh, function. You can actually explore the wellheads that are in active production or recently um, taken out of production and or proposed uh, drill sites. So you guys can check that out. Or if you come from another county or whatever, you can go check out your county over there. Okay. One of the first tools we have to, to make sense of oil and gas production. So there's a couple things here. I'm not going to talk about regulating the production per se. I don't, I'm not really involved with that kind of side of things. I'm more involved when there's an oil spill. So I know mostly about the downside of stuff. So I'm not, not uh, saying that we don't have uh, great regulations in terms of how we, how we lease oil and gas uh, sites out to, to 
production companies, but I do, I'm just not, a, not as familiar with that kind of stuff. So I'm going to talk to you guys about one of the risks of oil and gas production, which is the accidental release of oil or gas into the environment. There are, other, there are obviously other hazards, things like climate change, et cetera, but I'm just going to talk about um, the oil, the, the traditional oil spill, quote unquote. Cool? All right. So the first thing, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm going to run through a couple different major oil spills that we've had in history. And essentially how it's gone up until present, now we're so paralyzed, things happen and we don't seem to do anything. But historically, we'd have a problem as illustrated by a particular oil spill, and then we'd enact some new policy, some new law to respond to what, the, what led to the release that we saw there. And then we would carry that on forward until we had another problem, et cetera. So the first thing, one of the first big modern oil spills is this thing, the Torrey Canyon. This is, this is one of the world's first big super tankers. So not just a big ship, but a honking gigantor ship, right? And so the idea is this is so great, we can, economies of scale, we can take a much more, a uh, much larger volume of oil from point A to point B, it'll be cheaper, et cetera. So this happened in Great Britain, in the UK, and that tanker was going um, essentially from the south up to the north, and the captain said, hey, I could maybe make a shortcut, and decided to, to do a, take a slightly different course and essentially ran up onto a shallow bank and grounded the ship and tore open the belly of the ship and had this huge oil release. This oil then came out and, and was in the surface and it was very interesting. Um, this was before a lot of our existing monitor or thinking about ecological theory and this and that. This is in, this is in 1968, this is, a, this is the late 60s. People are starting to think about things but we don't yet have this notion of rigorous environmental sentinel monitoring and stuff like that before we have a problem. So this oil, uh, all kinds of interesting stuff happens. The oil goes different places. At one point, the oil slick goes towards the coast of France, and they use uh, diatomaceous earth, chalky cliffs, basically, to dive bomb the, the spill and essentially try to make the oil break up. Um, but the bulk of it goes towards the UK, goes towards the coast of England, and is deposited there and has a bunch of uh, impact, kills a lot of... Uh, barnacles and things in the intertidal and birds and all the things you would expect. So this freaked people out. It's like, oh my God, this great new technology, super tankers, not only is, is great in terms of bringing us cheaper oil, but it also is bringing greater risk associated with it. So we should, we should do something differently. So in the U.S., so this was unusual. There was a problem somewhere else in the world, and we responded here. That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily happen anymore. But, um, that, so the, one of the first things that come out of this, in addition to scientists starting to think about, hey, maybe we should be looking at a site before the spill happens and then after. So it, it, it didn't fully lead to that, but people started thinking about that. Um, as far as policy goes, we, uh, from this come the National Oil and Hazardous Substance Pollution Contingency Plan. So essentially the first, the first structured thinking about what we would do when one of these events happens. Um, yeah, cool. So that plan um, is, is modified through time. One of the most important parts of that is going to be open night. I'm going to hold on, not, won't, won't talk about it quite yet, but, but uh, Oil and Pollution Act of 1990 is the most recent major overhaul of this uh, national plan to deal with oil spills and plan for oil spills. But there's been several, several iterations and this thing has evolved through time. Hmm. Okay, so in my oh so well organized lecture, maybe we'll go to this part next. So this is uh, something uh, that I like. I usually use. These are what I think are significant oil spills. Now I typically work on marine oil spills, so mostly these are spills that, that deal with uh, oceanic releases. But these are the largest oil spills um, and the most significant oil spills in terms of policy and how we thought about stuff. So everything is scaled here to the uh, Deepwater Horizon because that's the most recent gigantic spill that we think of. The Deepwater Horizon was the largest marine oil spill in U.S. waters. It wasn't the largest oil spill uh, in the U.S. 
That distinction belongs to um, what happened uh, almost exactly 100 years before, to date before the deep water horizon happened. And that is what happened. The oil fields backed up behind us about an hour, hour and a half drive from campus here in Kern County. That's a Lakeview Gusher. So first I want to talk about the Lakeview Gusher. Uh, and, and, and just for quick before we go on, so Lakeview Gusher is, is not quite twice the amount of oil released as during the Deepwater Horizon. So everything here on the right is scaled to uh, the amount of, uh, or relative to the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, this one, 1991, we're not going to talk about any anymore after I put the slide away. But um, this was during the very first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Invades Kuwait, boom, boom, boom. Uh, then uh, the Allies come in and oust him. And on his way out, he sabotages everything in his wake. So it literally is a scorched earth policy, the, the, the actual definition of what scorched earth is. So as they're leaving, they first set all these oil fields on fire to screw the Kuwaitis up and try to burn up as much of their crude as they can. They break some of the valves, so they just have, water, just have oil pouring straight out into the sand or to the ocean. Um, and they set a lot of that oil on fire also to create this huge, giant, massive, thick, disgusting soot plumes that actually obscure satellite imaging. So, so the Americans and, and, and the Allies' great technological sophistication was muted by the fact that it was just this massive, thick, black fog that sensors couldn't easily see through. Um, so tr a truly hellish landscape. Um, it, because this was a war zone, we don't have good estimates. And so the numbers that I use are from this United Nations report, which is kind of the best that there is out there. But something on the order of maybe 120 to about 170 percent of the release of the Deepwater Horizon on the surface. That was, that was what remained on the surface. So more than that was released. But getting the actual volumes. Some of these fires burned for months. Um, and so, so it took a long time. They also booby-trapped all the minefields. So, so getting rescue people in to turn stuff off was, was slowed by the fact that people had to make it safe for them to get in. Uh, anyway, okay, good. So, um, so first we'll talk about Lakeview Gusher. So that was about, uh, like I said, a bit less than, than twice what the Deepwater Horizon uh, happened. So we'll talk about this just in context. This was before our modern thinking on environmental policy. And so nothing came out of this, in, in, in essence, uh, with the exception of some, some restrictions on how to drill and, and, and how you go about drilling. But this essentially, these are some guys drilling essentially by hand uh, in the area. Just a few guys were on the grapevine, came down the hill, and then we're on the flat area on the five, heading towards Bakersfield. Um, Button Willow, there's a Thule Elk Reserve there, so you guys can go see the cool Thule Elk Reserve. And I encourage everybody to go to the lake, to the... Um, Kern County Oil Museum, super cool. A lot of old retired folks there that have that have a lot of time on their hands, and they're great. Really, these old funky museums where sometimes the signs are a bit yellowing, but really cool stuff. Great insights, and something that a lot of our society's forgotten about. Um, but all these photos for by the Lakeview Gusher, I took from their collection. Uh, so, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so these guys are digging. Boom! Oil started coming out. Sweet, right? Love it, right? The big fountain of black, and everybody's super stoked. And then it kept going, and it kept going, and it kept going for a year. So it created these massive pools of uh, oil. So what we're seeing here are all just pure oil. So those guys over there are boating across a lake of oil that's about 30 meters deep. So there were um, three large lakes of that size, and it was just it, 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 they just couldn't stop it. So what you see here on the, the right is an effort to sandbag and contain this. It just kept growing and growing. The ground, you know, uh, um, cavitated beneath this, and it just and and they threw railroad cars into it. They threw boulders. They threw everything they could think of to plug it up, and it just it nothing would plug it up. Essentially, what finally happened was um, the pressure in that subsurface reservoir. Was, was equalized with the atmospheric pressure and it, and, it, and it stopped squishing out of the hole. Um, it wasn't anything that people did. Um, but there was great fear that these lakes might catch on fire and just, you know, what the heck was going on. It became a tourist attraction. They laid a special spur of railroad track out from LA. These people get in, the, get in the train from LA, go up and see it, and it was just crazy things, crazy stuff. Okay. Um, the most important, so we, we have the Torrey Canyon, which gets us to start thinking about planning. But then, the, the, by far the most important oil spill 
in terms of oil, in terms of law and policy for you guys, is the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. This is Unical Platform A. This is off of Summerlin, off of where I started the lecture, where those, where those uh, folks were sitting there and um, uh, where the big yellow house was. Um, didn't know this was happening, right? Until someone, unknown who to this day, nobody knows, went to some pay phone, picked up the phone at night, and called the local Santa Barbara newspaper. It said, you should know what's going on out on one of the oil platforms because there's an oil spill and uh, you need to figure out what's going on and you need to tell people, click. So that was the first inclination that something was going on. And what essentially happened was um, incorrect drilling. So we drilled into the ground to get to the oil and there was a discussion. Again, we didn't have the structures in place, the regulatory structures in place that we have now. And so the question was, hey, so we, we, we drilled a straw into the ground. Should we make sure that the, the hole that that straw is in is, is rigid, is, is, is protected? Typically, you put a metal sheath around the, the tube you've drilled, the hole you've drilled. They did. So, so the company asked the USGS at the time, the government scientist, hey, do you think we need to, sh how far do you think we need to sheath? And they're like, I don't know, whatever, just a little bit, it's probably fine. Well, it wasn't fine. So it cracked and it started leaking. And so the themes that we see here are repeated and, and, and become the themes for all these major oil spills we see since. Refugio, uh, everything. So the first theme is, is really immense and uncontrolled spill. Uh, you know, we don't understand why this is happening. We can't seem to stop it. Um, people started trying to jam stuff down into the, into the wellhead. Typically we do that with the stuff called drill muds, which is a heavy, uh, 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 silty, clay-like uh, material. Put that in and, and essentially jam it in, jam it in, jam it in, and then add cement behind that and put some more in and cement. Essentially plug up the tube, plug up the straw, block the straw so nothing can come up. Um, they put too much pressure in, and because that, because that straw was not armored, we essentially cracked it. And then it started coming up around the seabed, around the platform. So it was, it was pretty messed up. Primary flow here goes for 11 days, but we really have flow for at least a year at a reduced rate. Um, yeah, okay, so one theme is immense uncontrolled. The next thing is this notion of technological impotence. We can't bring any of our high-tech materials to bear or approaches to bear. And so that's what we see here. So this is actually looking down is actually a U-2 spy plane that was tasked to fly over our own territory as opposed to spying on Russia or something and take some film to start to image it because we didn't even know how to, how to get images of, the, of that scale. Um, and what you see here in this, in this picture, you see these other platforms, in, in this case in white, and then there's this huge uh, burbling of oil around the perimeter of the spill because they broke the, the surface of the, uh, they, they, they cracked, they fissured the area around the wellhead, so it's burbling up all around it. And this platform is essentially in a sea of oil. This oil migrates landward and it starts striking the beaches. That's when we seem to care about it, when it gets into our view. And so this is this scene on the right, and actually sorry, the right and the left are both in Santa Barbara Harbor. And so now, what is Santa Barbara? Santa Barbara is the nice place, right? Santa Barbara is where the Hollywood stars hang out. Santa Barbara is where the media people hang out. So it's, this isn't happening in some random podunk backwater place. This is where the powerful media moguls hang out, and they don't like that. So this gets a huge amount of national attention. Throw all this hay on the ground, and essentially the hay acts as an absorbent, and, and, and you know, um, just like a sponge, kind of suck up, that, suck up that oil, and then you scrape up all the straw and take it away. So they do all this work and get it cleaned up, and then what the hell happens the next day? More oil back in, the beach totally covered. What, gotta do it again, do it again, get that all cleaned up, okay cool, next day, what? More oil comes in. So it's this incredible media attention and this perception that nobody knows what the heck to do and nobody can respond to this. Um, if you see an oil spill now, like the refugio spill, what do they do? They throw a bunch of straw on the ground. 
They scrape it up. It's a, we, we've, we've come almost zero. Our technology of drilling is awesome, incredible. So if you're an engineer, it's one of the best fields to go into. Really high tech, really, really pushing the boundaries of technology and all this great stuff. Cleanup technology, we're still dumping straw uh, on this place. So, so that's, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to my management theme. I'm supposed to talk about policy here. Um, okay. Um, and then the, the last, the third, the third important theme that's going to impact our policy is this notion of what is this impact, this wider impact we're starting to recognize in the 60s. Um, and that is environmental impact. So in this case, you see a surfboard, so the recreational users are impacted. There's kelp, the, 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 the sort of uh, funky leather looking stuff here is, is oiled kelp. So the, the wider ecosystem is impacted. And then we have this cormorant, then we have seabirds, warm fuzzies, things that people care about, right? If we talk about kelp, people, mm, I don't know what kelp is. If we talk about poor widow birdie, what? Everybody cares about the poor widow birdie, right? And so, Huge um, hard strings being tugged, all that kind of stuff. This is the first oil spill. We try to clean seabirds in a, in a rigorous way using, deter using um, dishwashing detergent initially. Um, and that's the a veterinarian who started pioneering this uh, in the wake of the Santa Barbara oil spill. And we get these unfortunate statements from um, the owners of the company, or, the, or what, we now would recall, what we now would call in parlance of our policy, the responsible party. The responsible party gets up, and in this case, he's in the harbor of Santa Barbara talking to reporters, and he's talking about what's, what's, go, what's going on as, you know, all around him as he's speaking. He says, I don't like to call this a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds, right? Completely tone deaf completely not understanding what the community is getting up in arms about, right? They're up in arms. They're a bunch of surfers. They can't surf. And this guy's saying, well, it's not a disaster, right? He doesn't see it as a disaster. <clears throat> Related to these and, and completely important to the, the policy, the laws that are going to come in the wake of this, is all the massive media firestorm. Huge, again, a lot of the media vacation in Santa Barbara. A lot of the media consider this a place either where they live or they go vacation, and they don't like it, and they don't like it at all. So um, we see these themes. We see that eventually the president is shamed and has to come out and, and walk on the sand and poke his head down and go, yeah, well, that's really bad, you know. Um, we have uh, uh, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of protests. Um, we have things like Get Oil Out, an NGO that was formed that's still in existence to, in, in response. We have, we have public, we have citizens coming together and, and demanding action. Um, everything from naked protests at the, at the airport uh, to the high school throwing out the high school's uh, regular, plan, uh, regular um, play and writing a melodrama where, this is in Santa Barbara, right? So, so the... The poor defenseless woman is Barbara, and she's being attacked by this evil, evil oil company. Mm -hmm, the guy twiddles his mustache and stuff. The hipster that twiddles his mustache. So, so this is huge, and this really builds on this. At the same time this is happening, we have the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catching fire for the, I don't remember, third, fourth time. And people in Ohio are saying, hmm, river water is not supposed to be lit on fire. Water shouldn't be burning. You have people in Santa Barbara saying the ocean should not be delivering oil onto the beach, right? And so these are really, these, these are often cited as the birth of the modern environmental movement. That's not exactly right, but they really crystallized the, the, the worry, right? And this was sort of the, like the final straw. Like, what? We got to do something different. So in the wake of this, we have a bunch of stuff that, that comes on. So this is what happened with the, with the uh, spill. Um, I'll also just say that the, um, this really sets up, the Santa Barbara spill is essentially Xeroxed in every, uh, almost every single other spill we've had since. Certainly any marine oil spill, the playbook is Xeroxed from all parties. And oftentimes terrestrial oil spills, uh, it's the playbook. The short version is it's greedy, evil oil company, doesn't care about us, and the poor little birdies, right? Or, depending on who's writing the narrative, the, the oil companies versus the not in my backyarders, right? So those folks that formed Get Oil Out, the, the 
environmental organization, oftentimes would drive up to the protest in their big giant you know, Oldsmobiles by themselves. Get the oil out, right? They still need gas in their car. So uh, one of the narratives, the counter narratives that runs is, hey, these folks still want oil, they just don't want it in their backyard, right? They want it in the Niger Delta, they want it in the middle of the Amazon, right? Because then they don't get to see it. But these wealthy folks don't actually understand that this is important. So, so all these narratives are just copied almost from, from oil spill to oil spill to oil spill. You see them repeating, repeating, repeating. Okay. Um, but one, and I'll just say, uh, we'll finish up with this with the themes that are carried out because this does, this has influenced our thinking in terms of the laws that come in the wake of this. Um, the short version is we see a lot of toxicity to birds. Birds are heavily impacted in the Santa Barbara spill, as are things like dolphins and marine mammals that are swimming through this uh, material that are on the surface. They're, they're, they're going through the skim, the skin of the ocean where this oil is floating on top of. And then intertidal things, especially in the rocky intertidal. Because we had a little bit of heads up, some folks, particularly folks in classes at UCSB, graduate students, were able to run down to the beach, not everywhere, but a couple spots, and throw down some quadrats and actually start counting how many barnacles are there, et cetera, in this area, in, you know, of which um, many will be impacted in a couple hours or a day or so once that wave of oil comes and, and takes them out. So we had a little bit, some areas where we had pre versus post. So we can actually say how many critters were impacted. Um, that sets up a, a study uh, uh, that's funded by the University of, uh, well, the oil companies pay for a study um, by the University of uh, Southern California, which basically says, hey, how come everything didn't end? Why wasn't the world over? And what you hear is, oh, well, there's a lot of natural seep that happens, right? That's the tar that the Chumash are using to fill up their planks, their tumbles. So that's always been here. So the critters that are here are just used to it. It's cool, right? Don't stress. So for large-bodied critters, they've evolved oil tolerances and they can, they can get out of, they have behavioral responses. They smell the oil and go out of the way or something like that. Or microbes um, are here and they're really good at digesting oil. So in, in the Santa Barbara Channel, oh, when there's oil, they love it. They eat the oil. Ah, ah, ah. So don't worry about it. It's cool, right? Um, uh, this notion of out of sight, out of mind is really, really important, especially early on. So this notion uh, is that uh, this was the, during the primary 11 days, we had a couple storms that came through, and those storms helped break up the surface slicks. So they weren't as concentrated and as thick as they might otherwise have been. And so that's good. You know, what? The wind doesn't make oil go away. It just maybe makes it look different. Um, a lot of this stuff is, like I said, it's that heavy, thicker crude. It's, it's, it's more dense material. So it tends to sink more. So the notion is, ah, it wasn't as bad because it, le it, it sunk to the bottom. What the hell, right? What about the critters that live at the bottom of the ocean? What about the critters in the water column? So, so even though this was incomplete, and what the authors of this study say, the, their main conclusion is, we don't know what happened with this oil spill because we didn't have either we didn't have any, or we didn't have adequate pre-spill monitoring. So we couldn't say exactly how many jellyfish were nuked, exactly how many fish were nuked, exactly how many dolphins were, were nuked, right? And so, um, and so their recommendation is we should start monitoring, right? So what comes in the wake of 1969? You guys have probably learned about these. What are some of the laws that you guys know about? EPA, right? So, so President Nixon signs the EPA into existence. What else? It bursts the whole modern panoply of environment, federal environmental legislation. Clean Water Act? Yes, that's right. Clean Water <laughs> Act. Good. Right? Uh, um, NEPA, right? We, we, all these, all these general, general policies about air and water quality and about how we measure our impact um, were informed by this spill and, and, and related things. So the people in Santa Barbara will tell you that this, this did everything. It didn't do everything, but it was a key driver and absolutely on people's minds when we created the Endangered Species Act, uh, Clean Water Act, et cetera.
Okay. So next, um, uh, we're going to flash forward a bit. There's various things we could talk about, but I'll jump forward to the next major impact is going to be uh, the Exxon Valdez. So the Exxon Valdez was an oil tanker um, up in Alaska. We're drilling oil primarily in the north slope of Alaska, putting it in a pipeline, shipping it across the state of Alaska to ports in the southern part of the state, load up that oil onto tankers, and then transport them down primarily to the west coast to refineries. A guy named Hazelwood is the captain, a little drinky drinky, goes, decides he wants to go to bed early and leaves the ship in control of one of his mates who was not fully qualified and experienced and the ship runs aground, tears, tears the belly of the ship open, and it starts spewing oil out into um, an otherwise pristine bay in southern Alaska. And this is huge. So all these scientists, so I was an undergrad at the time, a lot of my colleagues would, went up to Alaska and started looking at what was going on. Um, the Exxon spill was really, really interesting because um, we did things, um, in a very forward-thinking manner in a lot of time, cases. One, we had a little bit more time in many cases before the oil landed in certain areas, and so we were able to establish more really good, robust pre-spill monitoring sites, so do some surveys. We did a lot of experimentation in the wake of the spill to try to take, take oil off of rocks and, and, the, and all that good stuff. What time do we end, you guys? 5.45, okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, flash forward. Okay, so, um, so up to this point, um, the idea is the federal government does everything. The federal government cleans everything up, does all, when it's a, when it's a okay, I didn't mention this yet. Um, on land, federal entity that's in charge, EPA, when there's an oil spill. If it's touching the salt water, it's the Coast Guard that is in charge of uh, dealing with the spill. So um, the Coast Guard is in charge here, and, and they're doing all this great stuff. The uh, Exxon, the oil company, what we now would call the responsible party, they um, essentially get a bill at the end that says, hey, this is how much the initial response cost, this is how much your impact to the environment is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, caused a lot of problems. It was hard to do. It had a lot of unique things impacted. It wasn't just a small spill, it was a large spill. So it impacted um, not just people's livelihoods, but in some cases their ability to eat and stuff, right? So this is salmon runs were heavily impacted. A lot of these uh, native Alaskans and other folks were, um, you know, that, that's how they got food for the winter. And so it was a much more extensive um, impact in terms of the, the sociology and the life and the economy of that part of southern Alaska. So uh, what comes out of this is this thing called what everybody refers to as OPA 90. So the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, Exxon spills in 1989. So this is the following year. So this is back when we have a problem and the law and policy actually changes or people try to do something. Uh, that unfortunately isn't the case anymore. But um, uh, so, so Open 90 changes some things, sets up a new way to go about dealing with oil spills, sets up a thing called NERDA, the Natural Resources Damage Assessment. Oh, great. This mark doesn't work. How lame is that? This one work? So we have the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, and that, and that sets up a bunch of things. First, NERDA, the Natural Resources Damage Assessment, which is going to be conducted, that's going to tell us what was actually damaged. Now, before this, we, we, ha we go out and we find out that we killed 100 sea otters. Poor little sea otters, right? Eh, everybody cries about the sea otters. So, sea otters. Now, what are we going to do? How much does a sea otter cost? Uh, essentially... The sea otters, the recreation, all the different uh, activities that were what we would now maybe call ecosystem services that were impacted. You go talk to an economist and hear environmental economist, and he or she adds them all up and go, boop, here's the bill. 
and they calculate that a, that a sea otter is worth $5,500 per sea otter. You multiply it through, and they get a bill for that. After the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, that's not how it works. How it works is we determine that we killed 100 sea otters. You have to make 100 more sea otters. That's, the responsible party has to make another 100 sea otters. If they can do that by shooting orca whale, well, orca whale is a bad example, but, um, <laughs> but, but by, by reducing predation, by doing something, putting up nets or something like that, that's, that's okay. If they can show that that clearly is, is boosting the resource. If they have to set up a, a, a nursery for baby sea otters that we help moms give birth and all that kind of stuff, whatever, right? It's, 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 it's a whole variety of, of things that are available and we don't care, and we don't care how much it costs. It's on the responsible party to replace that resource, not some game about how much this thing costs per, per individual otter or what have you, um, which, 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 is, which is great. It's an improvement, right? We don't have to waste all this time bickering back and forth about how much a sea otter costs. But what it's done is it's put a greater emphasis on exactly exact measurements of how much the resource, how much, how much of, the, of the existing resource was harmed, right? So, uh, so we have that. Uh, Nerda, we also have what um, the, the, the new command structure for, for oil spill responses. So what that says, and that's what's highlighted here in yellow, what that says is the responsible party is going to be part of the response, okay? So it's federal law that we have a pipeline that bursts, the pipeline company is part of the response is in, inside the command center, right? The public doesn't seem to like that, right? As we found out the Deepwater Horizon, Refugio, all these examples. People, uh, jo Joe Blow that hears this, oh, the, so, the, so the guy started a fire, uh-huh, and then the guy that started the fire is in with the firemen trying to put out the fire? I, well, how does that work, right? But in many cases, we need those folks because they understand how the pipeline works. In the case of something like the Deepwater Horizon, they have the robots that can go to the bottom of the ocean. The government has no robots. Industry has like 11 or 13 that they could bring to bear on the Deepwater Horizon. We, so, so, so it's recognition of the complexity of most of our oil spills today require the industry to be at least technologically assisting us because the government doesn't have all of the tools that we might otherwise wish they would have. Okay, so, so, we, we, have, so we, we set up this, this new structure and all that kind of good stuff, and we're probably going to run out of time here, right? Um, the same day. Okay, then, uh, then another major thing that comes along is 9-11. Is so 9-11 happens, and we change how we respond to disasters at the federal level. So we, everything falls under now what we call the National Incident Command or the National Incident Command System. And that is a program that's supposed to be in place for any kind of major disaster. It could be a chemical explosion, could be a terrorist attack, could be an earthquake in, in LA, it could be a hurricane in New Orleans, whatever. And we have all this paramilitary organizational structure. Just like you, we're most familiar with this in California with our wildfires, right? Wildfire happens, and we have all these different agencies, maybe different departments, whoever come together, and there's, there's a, a hierarchical command structure. So there's a, a head person or a head agency, and then underneath them, they have all these other agencies, and then underneath, underneath them are either other agencies, et cetera. So this National Incident Command System is what we have uh, in place, and oil spills are but one of the, of the potential contingencies that are looked at. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, Deepwater Horizon. So let's talk about what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. So, so that, that, that's the stuff we have coming into this. Uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, comes, we've been drilling deep, deep. Deepwater Horizon is 1,500 meters from the, the air to the bottom of the ocean, and then we start drilling. So very logistically challenging. Um, essentially, the straw that we stuck into the ocean was not uh, was a great straw. It was a solid straw, but we didn't um, maybe main do some of the maintenance that we otherwise should have done. Uh, one of the things that happened was we uh, 
had some uh, imperfections in the tube. And long story short, that allowed, so, so the drilling was done. We found the oil, everything was all good. And they were in the process of capping that, temporarily sealing that well. Then we're gonna move the drilling platform away and bring in what's called a production platform. It's gonna, it's gonna be attached to the wellhead and that's what we normally produce oil with and then you know, for a couple years or however long the lifespan of the, of the oil uh, goes, of the reserve goes. And in that process, that's what went wrong. It was, it, was a, it was a failed cementing, and it allowed a bunch of natural gas to essentially burp up, to come up the, called a, called a methane kick, it came up the, the pipe, and it caught fire and exploded, and, and the, the platform burned, and then it sunk, and when it sunk, it ripped open the tube, and then the oil just started flowing. Um, uh, again, this is, a, you, this is a, a shot from an ROV, from a, a robot, an industry robot, not government robot. And so they are using, there's, there's a, essentially a big giant crimp tool, a big giant pincher tool. It's on the bottom of the pipe and there's a box around the pipe. This thing is called a blowout preventer. And the idea is if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, you, you flick the switch and this thing will crimp and pinch the, the straw so that nothing can flow through it. And it didn't work. And so for about three days, all you saw on the news was this picture, or a picture similar to this, where this robot arm was like click, 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 click. Click, 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 right? It's just like when you're trying to get the, the, get the gas burner to light on your barbecue, you're like click, click, click. What? Well, if I try it 17 more times, maybe one of those will work, right? <laughs> or, 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 or the channel's not changing, I'm just gonna push it more and 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 more. I don't get up and walk two feet, but you know, more and more. <laughs> Same thing, it was literally click, 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 click. Didn't work. All kinds of problems associated with this spill. Um, uh, but one of the key things that we now know is going on is back then in the Santa Barbara oil spill, even for that matter with the Exxon spill, it was primarily a company. The company uh, bought, the, or, or bought the leasing rights to the land. The company had a drilling machine that punched a hole in the ground. The company had a, a, a well ar architecture that went around it came out, the company put it in the company's tankers, the company took it to, you know, wherever. It doesn't work that way any, anymore. There's all this integration. So almost all this stuff is subcontractors upon subcontractors upon subcontractors. So in the case of the, we talked about uh, the BP's oil spill, BP, it's a consortium of all these other oil companies that are working together. BP had the majority, 65% share, but it, it wasn't all a BP thing. So you have these much more complicated layers of stuff. Complicated layers of oversight, right? Complicated layers of who's responsible. Complicated layers of checking for safety and what's, what's following. So it's just massively complex. Um, yeah, okay. Um, the other thing that we see in, with, with these, these modern eras uh, is what I would say, um, has Dr. Steele talked about regulatory capture? Okay. All right. So, um, so uh, at the time of the Deepwater Horizon, the entity that's controlling leases, these leases are all your lease. This is all your resource. Let's be clear. This is the American public's resources. Oil in the ground, minerals in the ground are your resources. So what happens is we say, hey, we're going to go and and... Uh, we have something here underneath this, this tile right here on the floor, and there might be something in there. Who wants to bid on it for me? And you guys will all come. Maybe you'll take your ships, and you'll do some exploratory testing and stuff, and then, you know, one of you guys thinks it's worth X, somebody else thinks it's worth Y, and you guys are going to make your bids, give them to me, and the highest bid, I'm going to go, okay, cool, you win, right? So you get this area. What you're actually bidding on is you're bidding on the right to drill. You're not bidding on oil. You're build, bidding on the right to drill and whatever's, whatever resources are below there. So you're gambling, right? You're hoping that your, your science and everything, and sometimes these guys like science, right? When it's that kind of stuff, they like science. Um, and, and so it's, it's, we're predicting that, hey, we're going to get all this oil out of the ground. And so they go and do it. Those folks that regulate that, so the folks that are doing the... Um, Leasing, making the money, and the safety over ins oversight inspection people are all the same folks, similar to the FAA. The people that are making sure everybody can fly and all that kind of stuff and, 
and, and efficient flights, that's the FAA, and the entity that's going and inspecting and making sure that the planes are bolted together, same entity, right? Kind of danger when that happens, right? So um, in the wake of this, we actually split what's, what's known as the Minerals Management Service into two parts. Now one of the parts has safety and oversight and inspection, and the other deals with the leasing and stuff. So, so they're, they're, even though the West Coast office of that, that entity is, is in Camarillo, and because of money, they haven't physically located different buildings, so they're all, they're all in the same building, but now some go on this, or some are on this side of the building and some are on that side of the building, and they're separate. Um, so with regulatory capture, the idea is um, there's this huge exchange between industry and regulators. And, um, and the regulation isn't necessarily as, and the oversight isn't as robust as we perhaps might like to see. We hear a lot of this when we talk about Wall Street. The, the, the Federal the Securities and Exchange Commission that's going to make sure people aren't doing insider trading and stuff, it's, it's, it's hard. A lot of those folks go and work for the industry. Industry goes and work for the regulators. So there's this huge back and forth. Now, just working exchange from regulators to industry, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? You want people that understand how the industry works. You want people that know how this stuff goes. But you have to be real careful that there isn't too much wink, wink, nod, nod. In the Deepwater Horizon, when the Deepwater Horizon thing was happening, I, I, had a, I formed a working group that we were helping, un, helping people understand what was happening. Um, I'd be asked to come talk, give lectures to the Minerals Management Service here in Camarillo. I, the random weird professor dude from CSUCI, would be asked to talk to them so that they could get an update. Their regional office, their, their, their entity in New Orleans, their entity that handles oil and gas leases in the southern uh, the Gulf region wasn't talking to anybody. That's bizarre. That's like saying something's going wrong with the Camarillo Police Department and they're asking us you know, to give them some info because the Thousand Oaks Police Department won't, won't talk to them. You're like, what? You guys are all cops. Shouldn't you guys be talking to each other? Um, and so, so the general thing that seems to have happened is a lot of regulatory capture um, and a lot of maybe not being as oversight filled as we'd like. So for example, here's an example of that. This is the amount of oil that was flowing out during the Deepwater Horizon event. This is the permit for um, saying, hey, can, we're a lot, can we have a lease here? Okay, can we drill here? And part of that uh, with our you know, um, uh, environmental planning and all that good stuff, we say, hey, what could possibly go wrong this could possibly go wrong, and then what would we do? Here, here are the resources we have in place to respond to you know, uh, a, a potential bad thing. So in that planning document, um, in their permit, it says they might be releasing up to 160,000 barrels of oil per day if, if everything goes totally wrong and the pipe breaks and just flows out. This is what the National Incident Command, again, that's the... That's the, the government response command center to try to deal with this oil spill that's happening. This is what they say was going to be happening. It's a hint. Maybe they didn't read the actual documents that were, that were approved, right? So they have this lower volume. What, and, then, and then we start the spill and we start having these initial, we're down here, incredibly low ball estimates of 5,000 barrels a day, like completely ridiculous. Like, me, everybody looking from afar is like, no way, that's not even close to 5,000 barrels a day. It's way more than that. And then over time, which is what all these represent, we start getting better estimates for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and this is, this is, these are the numbers that I typically use, which is from this panel of experts that came together to, to estimate how much oil was coming out. Um, the judge, the federal judge, used a slightly lower number because, you know, he's a judge. Um, but that's, I think, the reality of the situation. Um, but how this comes into play with this regulatory capture, when we finally cap, uh, actually before, before we completely cap the well, when we finally get it um, uh, essentially a, a, a tube over the, the top of the well and can suck up that oil into tankers, and, and we start taking the oil, not allowing the oil to go in the ocean, all of a sudden we run out of tankers. So we can't, there's nowhere to put the oil we've brought to the surface. So we have to let the oil start flowing back into the ocean. 
and the and the explanation for that was the coast the the uh, incident command said, oh well, you know, we didn't understand the we didn't understand uh, how much volume was coming out. Baloney, baloney. This was the worst case scenario. This is what they earlier in the spill said the worst case was. So they should have been ready for this. So this notion of Again, this theme of, of technological incompetence, we, it, it, this stuff's gotten so complex, it's hard for us to get a handle on, et cetera. Okay, so in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon, the, the policy uh, tools that, that come and the laws that come in the wake of it are exactly, whoop, whoop, nothing, okay? Some people will tell you, well, it's not exactly true, we're changing some things, not really. President Obama shuts down uh, deep water operations temporarily, a moratorium on new deep water drilling and, and that kind of stuff. And the industry goes crazy. This is the worst thing ever. This is totally causing all this dislocation, yada, 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 massive pressure. And so what happens after a few months? Mm, okay, yeah, every, you can keep doing that. Go ahead. No law, no significant law, no significant legislation has come out of this spill. Flash forward to the refugio spill. Sorry, my out of order slides. Flash forward to the refugio spill. And again, we see problems with oversight, problems with maintenance, lack of enforcement of regulations that already exist. In this case, in the case of refugio spill, it's a broken pipeline as opposed to a, 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 a well bore that, that's breaking. So this guy, uh, this happens on May 19th. And this is, is that a terrestrial area. So it's the area over here where I have the culvert openings. And um, the pipeline is underground. The pipeline breaks. Water pool, or the, excuse me, the oil pulls up and eventually fills up this area over here and then, and then spills into this culvert. This culvert goes underneath the 101 and starts spilling onto the beach. And so, so it's primarily a terrestrial spill, but a fraction of the total um, gets to the ocean and the beach and ocean. Um, Lots of problems here. The agency, the entity that oversees this pipeline is a federal entity. Even though it's on state land, it, it, the pipeline starts inside the state of California, ends inside the state of California. It's not an interstate shipping thing, which, would, what, which is what typically triggers federal oversight. Nevertheless, the feds have authority over it, and the feds are massively underfunded. Massively underfunded. So one other, another phenomenon we see with a lot of this regulatory problem is that we have these laws and policies in place, but it's hard to enforce them or hard to do the inspection regime because the entity, state, federal, local, whatever it is, doesn't have the appropriate level of staffing and or the appropriate level of funding. And so we can't go and do the inspections, <clears throat> which is the worst of all possible worlds, right? Because then what happens is people that hate regulation go, this is baloney. And the environmentalists or whoever, the advocates for the community are saying, this is baloney, we're not doing it. So everybody is ticked. Everybody gets angry. And then weird things happen in elections. Um, so so in, in this case, what was going on was um, not proper oversight. What happened in the Deepwater Horizon? Not proper oversight. What happened in the Exxon Valdez? Not proper uh, 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 responsible behavior of the operators, right? So there's a, there's a constant theme running through this. Rarely is it that an, an earthquake happens and the, the, the landslide comes and breaks the pipe and then makes an oil spill. That does happen. But increasingly what we see is what's driving these systems are the failure to enact the policies and regulations that we actually already have in place. Uh, in the wake of this, we actually have seen some movement uh, at the local level, not the federal level, but at the local level, which is to bring some of these pipelines that fall within state jurisdiction under a state inspector's uh, purview. Um, right. 
So um, things have got so right. Um, in the case of what happened uh, in this particular location, the walls of the pipe were in some places where it broke uh, one sixteenth of an inch thick metal. I mean, it was, it's like paper. It's like the paper in your in your notepad, really, really about to be pierced by you know a finger. You can push a finger through it at some points. Um, so. Typically, we send these things through. These are called pigs. These are, these are um, uh, little, it's, the basic ones are just actual physical things like a rubber stopper type stuff up to much more sophisticated materials that can either scour and clean or in the case of, of inspections actually have magnetometers and things that can check the thickness of the metal. We'd actually put one of these guys through just a little bit before the break happened and, uh, and people were processing the data. So if they'd had, who knows, another couple weeks, they might have said, oh my gosh, this pipeline is super weak at this point, or at these points, let's stop production and go fix it, but we, we missed it. Um, the story of this is interesting. So there was a guy, th th there were some folks doing maintenance. So they depowered, they took the oil out of the, out of the pipeline, and they... A uh, uh, guy was doing maintenance and, and you know, fixing things and, and, and doing whatever the maintenance was. Finished, said, okay, go ahead, do it, and recharge the, um, you know, put oil back in the pipeline. That seems to have been, we don't have the final, final report yet, but that seems to have been what happened. So that, that spike in pressure as we put the oil back in, blow, cracks the pipe and causes the hole. The typical sensors that tell us that we have a, a pressure spike warning are ignored because they're like, oh, we're just putting the oil back in the line. It's going to kind of change for a little bit here. So the fact that it's not fully up to the full uh, pressure is OK because it's just building up, even though what it was actually doing was actually squirting out of the side of the pipe. Um, then a guy says after a little bit, an hour or two, hey, turn off the pipe again. I want to do some more maintenance. Depowers it again or, or depressurizes it again. And then works on the thing some more. This is, this is in a location, not where the break happened. This is in another location. And then calls the center again, oh, turn it back on. And right, so there was all these random things. So there was this, there was this weird communication. Then there was also a team of, of folks doing an oil spill drill about two miles from where this was. And they're practicing for oil spill drill, practicing for oil spill drill. And then some folks at the beach smell something and go, uh, called police. Hey, I think there's some oil around here. It smells really oil like. So the dispatcher calls up the, calls up the crew that's, that's on the oil spill drill and says, hey, I think there's, I think there's something going on. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know. We're at an oil spill drill. Like, no, 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 seriously, you should go check. Like, what? You should go check. Um, okay, we'll go check, right? And so they go check, partly thinking it might be a drill. And then they're like, oh, my gosh, there's, there's oil, right? So it was this huge confusion as to what time did it actually happen, when did people respond, when were people on scene, and, um, and so that happens. And so, and so the narrative that emerges from there is, oh, you know, come on, it was an accident, it was an accident. Flash forward to one year later, and uh, in this case, it's the Groves incident, what we sometimes call the Hall Canyon spill. So this is a pipeline just above Ventura. This is this summer. And uh, uh, doing maintenance on a valve. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Have massive bright lights up there. They're working on into the night. They work to at least 10.30. Again, this is not, the final report is now, so I don't have all the data, but, but about 10.30 at night. Working, 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 replacing the valve. Replace, replace, replace. One of the gentlemen that is contractor is looking at this and he says, hey, I don't think that thing's set right. The, the, the you know, pipe connection isn't, isn't super good. Other folks are like, it's cool, dude. It's all good. It's like, you sure? Yeah. All right. Close it all up. Turn the lights out. Go home. About 4.30 the next morning, a, a resident that lives down the downhill from where that location is, um, it's, it's summertime. So he's sleeping with his wife, and he has the window open. And he wakes up, and he's like, what the hell is that smell? It really smells. Oh, I, wait. Did that one here first? No, first he heard, heard, heard uh, this high-pitched whine. What the hell is that? Whatever. Probably that was the, the blow-off valve bursting. And so he go, rolls over, goes to sleep, and then about a half hour later wakes up, like, what's that smell? 
goes outside. His backyard is really steep. Uh, uh, um, so it's a street in front, but in the back, it's backyard. Then it goes down this deep ravine, and he's like, you know, it's dark out. Like, what the? Oh wow, really strong smell. What? Goes over, gets in his moped. <laughs> moped's around. Moped's around the road. Moped's up to where he knows the, there's this pipeline, and he sees this oil flowing out of the valve. So he calls. He gets on his cell phone and calls 911. Said there's oil flowing out in the river. And like what? And it tells him. And then he calls the 1-800 number on the pipeline in case of you know, oil spill, call. And he calls, in, in this case, the, the dispatch center is in Long Beach. He gets to Long Beach, he goes, hey, you know your pipeline blah, blah, blah is spilling? Like, the, wait, what? Where, where are you? Like, what? And so, so, right, in both cases, in our Refugio pipeline case, in our Groves, can, uh, Groves um, pipeline case, it's not all this sophisticated high-tech sensor network, ooh, all robots and stuff like that. It's actually some, some person, hey, what's that smell that's triggering the event? So that should tell us that our, that our sensor system, that our oversight policy needs to be adjusted somewhat. We would like the pipeline to tell us when it's leaking, as opposed to some Joe Blow person walking their dog saying, hmm, there shouldn't be oil on the ground, should there be? So, okay. So that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's a little bit about that good stuff. And you guys go to just right now? Is that what you guys go to? Uh -huh. Okay, great. So, um, all right, so sorry for a bit rambling, a bit rambling discussion of, of policy there. But so right now, the most important legislation, uh, Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act is going to set some of the penalties. So we talk, talked initially about, hey, we have this oil spill. We killed some. We had some bad. We... we, we we incurred some costs to stop the oil and clean up the oil. That's a direct bill to the responsible party. And if we hurt any uh, uh, sea otters and stuff like that, that's, a, that's a, a bill. But then, separate from that, we have other provisions in, in uh, legislation like the Clean Water Act that it depends on how many barrels of oil we, we release into the environment. Um, they, the oil company has to pay an additional fine on top of that stuff. So the last thing I'll just say really quick before you guys go is you need to understand how this works. So there's, even though the responsible party is inside the control room or inside the control center with the, with the folks that are directing cleanup, there's a natural tension there. Why? We all admit that we're driving this truck around and the oil company is going to get billed for that truck. But the other part is how much oil is being released, right? That's going to be adjudicated. And so, not ascribing any nefarious purpose to anyone, but just natural human tendency, if I'm sitting there and maybe going to find Hayden a ton of money for what he's doing, he's maybe going to want to try to maybe not be as in trouble, right? If we talk about Deepwater Horizon, what, what did BP do? BP went and bought up entire biology departments from some universities. They went to them. Poor part of the country, not a lot of funding. They said, "Hey, you know what? We're going to give you guys five million. Well, we're not supposed to know the amount. We're going to give you guys a lot of money, and you guys are going to be our experts. Okay, okay. Well, you guys have all this money. Okay, you just got to sign this thing that says that you know you won't you won't disclose anything without checking with us first, right?" And the government starts going around, hey, 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 the guy's doing the natural resource damage assessment. Hey, hey, can you, can you help us with this? Can you do this? Okay, cool. You just, but, you know, don't, really, don't publish this without talking to us first, right? So everybody starts grabbing their guys, right? And so where we see it most, where I've seen it most, is in the absolutely time-critical thing of collecting data in the field. So right now, how much oil is in the water? What's the concentration of oil in the water? I want to go sample it. No, 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 you professor guy. So, yeah, no, uh-uh, sorry. There's a lot of bureaucracy. We filled out 17 different requests. There's 17, filled that request 17 different times to take some of our underwater robots into the area around the refugio spill. Constantly push back. Our drones, same thing. We could, we could have helped with the surface model, monitoring and modeling. Yeah, no. Even though we had some agencies, some federal agencies were part of the National Incident Command asking us to bring our tools in to help them, the bureaucracy says, mm, yeah, no thanks. Mm, yeah, could you fill out a form? Okay, we'll fill the form out again. And then, you know, next day, so can we come in now? Can we do this? Yeah, mm-mm. Can you fill out the form? 
already filled out the form. No, I don't think you filled out the form. Yeah, we did. No, can you fill it again? Okay, 17 times that happened, right? So we have this incredibly technologically sophisticated society right now, right? The United States is probably the most sophisticated, wealthiest country in the history of this planet. We don't appear to be using that technology and that sophistication as effectively as we could be, right? And, but one example is the fact that we haven't had any significant new policy, new regulation come out of Deepwater Horizon or anything else anytime soon. So that's my quick take. All right. Thanks, you guys. Sorry that was a bit rambling.